I was living in San Francisco at the time. This okay. was like, I don't know, maybe four or five years ago. And I actually had a sex dream about you. <gasps> oh, 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 that's not where I thought this was going. Oh my gosh. I, but I know where it's coming. <laughs> I totally. Tell me more, and I boss. Did. Welcome to Scream Dreams, the nightmares that shaped us, where we talk to your favorite filmmakers about their nightmares and what actually terrifies them. I'm James A. Janice. And I'm Catherine Corcoran. And today we're joined by Joe Lynch, filmmaker extraordinaire. Not one of your favorite filmmakers, but hopefully someday. We'll see. I, it may be. Since Wrong Turn 2, one of my favorite filmmakers. Oh, flattery gets you everywhere, James. <laughs> I know, Joe. <laughs> Well, it's great. It's great to be here. And I took notes. So I hope, uh, you know, like, well, I want to make sure that I'm fully prepared. I heard about that. You know, you do a lot of podcasts and most times it's like, we're a podcast. Oh, what do you guys talk about? Stuff. Mm -hmm. Whereas you guys have a defined thesis. Right. And, mm -hmm. you know, and I've been dealing a lot with dreams lately. So I've been I've actually been uh, if you're a wet hot American summer fan, I've been gurnling, if you will. <laughs> So yeah, one person, one person. I in the got world. it. Those of us who maybe haven't seen that movie in a while, uh, what, how, what's how can you? It's it's journaling, but the way Paul Rudd says it, it's gurnling. Oh, okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a it's a hard J. I have a lot of Paul Rudd dreams too. Yeah. I mean, who doesn't? Nah, yeah, Come yeah. on, right? But I wanted to make sure that I was prepared. So you know. So how did you prepare for us? I but dreamed. <laughs> oh, yeah. wow. I got. I got Five and a half hours of sleep, not six. Oh. No, 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 no. Actually, I got five and a half dreams, not four. So five and a half. Wait, five and a half. So you have five hours. And a half. I usually have about five and five to five and a half hours a night, which of is sleep. bad. It's bad. That's that, it. That's not good. No, yeah. I know it's not good. You know, it's so what happens when you make a movie, guys. I believe it. You, you know? on yeah. your downtime. That's it. I. That's it. Like I. I'm the type of sleeper that I will go to sleep immediately the oh, second nice. oh, that like amazing. my head hits the pillow yeah. we talked about this at um I, I think it was at the silver screen con we were talking yeah. we, were, we were conversing about dreams while uh -huh. you know doing shots it was great yeah. um, <laughs> as you do and um yeah I can hit the once my head hits the pillow out but I will wake up at four o'clock five o'clock in the morning and that's it i'm done like i, I don't yeah, lay there up, and be out. restless the rest of the time do, do you feel tired throughout the day because you've only gotten this much sleep or are I, you I don't have time functional? for that uh, oh, like, okay honestly yeah. like i don't have time to be tired you are know? you uh, a caffeine consumer yeah a lot okay. <laughs> yeah. well then honestly that sounds fine to me. i don't know your what you're existence. talking about james not at all <laughs> as he sips of coffee oh. your your existence sounds great to me uh, as far as sleep schedule goes because lately i've been having trouble falling asleep which is the worst when you're just like i there. can never fall asleep yeah last really? night yeah. i had a awful time going to sleep and then waking up like every hour or so just like i think i was i don't know anxious I about about had... about filming today a little bit of yeah. like waking up on was time was it me uh, yes. yeah, I was like, the, oh, the pressure, Joe's such a hard interview. <laughs> the pressure to have great questions for you and to just keep you invested. Or maybe just different questions than the 400 of the same questions that I've had for the past month, <laughs> right? <laughs> Promoting suitable flesh out now on VOD and theaters. <laughs> I have, I see, I'm still in PR mode. Yeah. I, I dream now the last three weeks. Honestly, I have dreamed being in interviews oh. and the nightmare of there was one dream that I had that for some reason I had one of those really cool book backgrounds that everyone yeah. had on Zoom for mm -hmm. a while where they're like, ooh, I need to go to Ikea and just buy a bunch of books and just put them in the background so yeah. I seem studious and intelligent. <laughs> and my dream was that someone asked me about one of the books in the back and I didn't I did know. know. They were like, oh. oh, tell, oh, you're a big fan of Inf Infinite Jest. I'm like, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh uh, yeah, big, big, big fan dream. of uh, that that writer. Crap. Now, most of my dreams lately have been fraught. It, it's how I think my brain deals with trauma and um, and anxiety. Yeah. If for some reason it personifies it somehow, and I don't know if it makes it better that I wake up going like, oh. I just exercise those demons. Mm -hmm. it, most times I wake up going, oh God, like now yeah. I have to deal with the day. But yeah, usually five to five and a half hours of sleep lately. Um, I was told I was mandated la uh, like in the last couple of days now that PR is kind of wa wound down a bit uh -huh. to try to go for six. Yeah. But then I just lay there in bed and I just 
Because six would be like four cycles. It's like 90 minute cycles Mm -hmm. of sleep. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I'm not the expert. You guys are clearly experts. I, I took here, a class. So. In a, in <laughs> Did you college. really? Yeah, it was Part like a 400 of, level psych class. Really yeah, about like just sleep about sleeping and, and what your brain does while it's sleeping and uh, yeah, REM cycles in the phase one through phase four and REM. Huh. Oh wow! Yeah, I mean, part of the the reason we were even t- when we were talking about just testing this out is like because James doesn't really dream. I exclusively have nightmares, and it's this kind of exploration of like why this happens huh. and figuring it all out. So everyone coming in with their you know with their their thoughts and and patterns is is illuminating in a way. What's, I think it's anxiety. I I I think that. Well, here, full disclosure, now we're going to be transparent here. <laughs> I used to smoke a shitload of weed. <laughs> Just being honest. Um, for years, I would, I'd be a nighttime smoker mm-hmm. and, you know. Just, like before bed? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, like in between the eight and 11 hour, mm-hmm. I would, you know, hush, you know, hushly walk away and go into the bathroom and smoke a bowl or sometimes sit there and watch a movie and smoke a bowl or. A well, now it's or legal whatever. so you can say it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, but. And I didn't know this until after the fact. It completely eradicated my dream process. Like oh. I couldn't eat. I, I think I even said this to a therapist. Like I don't dream. They're like, No, you do. You just don't remember it. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. so I was blank. I don't like. It would just be fall asleep and then wake up and no recollection at all of dreams. Um, when I stopped about a year ago, um, from you know the nightly or the, I guess like you'd say the the daily consumption of cannabis um yeah about a year and a half ago is before we started shooting suitable flesh um i just went i'm done like i don't want to do it every day and stuff like that i need to be on point you know Mm -hmm. plus my bosses are here so i have to make sure that they know (laughs) that i was not under the influence of any um substances while making that film yeah um it was all legal substances i swear (laughs) um but immediately i had a floodgate of dreams again. Oh, like, interesting! Wow. It's something that I've read about. Where if you, you know, if you don't dream for a while, basically because of weed or what have you, when you stop, you it's it's like fucking Nightmare on Elm Street. You know, like you get these intense dreams that um, sometimes you don't even realize you're dreaming. Like, or that when you recall, you go, I don't think I was, I, was I awake? It, it's one of those moments that you always see in Nightmare on Elm Street movies where it's, or in um, American Werewolf in London, mm-hmm. where it's like, he wakes up from the dream and goes, what a horrible <laughs> dream. And then wakes up and up. realizes he was in another dream. Yeah. Yeah. That's how intense they were. They are vivid dreams, stuff that I can even recall now going like, wow. Um so uh, anyway, kids, don't do drugs. <laughs> well, were they were they like scary dreams? Oh or yeah. Like what specifically was like? Um, very just very vivid, like vivid to the point where, see, my I'm sorry if we're going off on tangents, but I guess no, that's no, the no, show. No, no, this is amazing. I dream in cinema, like okay. I uh-huh. I dream oh, like I mean you're a director, so yeah, I, it makes total sense. I guess like, but I'll. I'll dream where I will have uh, shot construction. I mm-hmm. will have montage, you know. Um, I will have passage of time that, like, I don't know if you guys, this happens to you, but when I dream, sometimes I jump in time. Oh, yeah. Like, like it just, it feels like uh, like Pulp Fiction in a way where storylines are kind of all over the place. Yeah. Um, but usually it's, it's being in a situation that I'm not very comfortable in and usually it will devolve into me waking up going, oh, God, that sucks. And a lot yeah. of times it's falling, um, which is something oh. that like we incorporated into the movie. Um, mm-hmm. uh-huh. There's a dream sequence in Suitable Flesh out now in VOD and theaters. Um, <laughs> that, uh, or I should be saying that, uh, out now in theaters and VOD. Um, <laughs> that when we were doing the, the fall scene, I actually dreamed that exact construct in the movie where there was an overhead because I have like out of body ex- experiences when I'm dreaming as well. Oh, I don't like do it where I'm like, n- yeah, exactly. Okay. Wow. It's more of like a, a Gears of War, like slightly above mm-hmm. eye level, mm-hmm. you know, where yeah. I'll watch myself in s- situations. And um, usually when I fall, I'm never like looking up. I'm always watching myself fall from three or four other cameras. <laughs> and then I know that this is like something people go like, oh, but if you, you know, die in a dream, you, you die in up. real life yeah. or you <laughs> or you immediately wake up. I think up, that's my you know? Elm Street, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> but that was something that was always ingrained in my head mm-hmm. that if you die in a dream, 
that's it, pal. You know, so oh. for, you know, for as long as I remember, anytime that I was, I fell in a dream, I would always wake up. Mm-hmm. I remember that this actually happened on, on the set while we were in Mississippi shooting. And it came home from uh, a really long night of shooting. Uh, and I don't sleep well during the day. I hate night shoots. Mm-hmm. So I'm like Al Pacino in Insomnia where I'm putting foil up against the walls because I can't yeah. have any light leaking in. I need to sleep at night. I can't, I don't nap well. I just, give oh. me that yeah, five, five and a half five, hours. Yeah, give me that five and a half to six hours at night and I'm good. Wow. Um, but I had this dream where I fell off of what was a facsimile of the building that we were shooting at in the movie. This was a couple days after. And, um, you know, safety is something that is so important to us as filmmakers. And, yeah. you know, you want to make sure that everybody is safe. We were shooting um, in this office building and we, you know, everybody was very concerned making sure that all the stunt people, like, there's nothing worse than being the director or the producers on a set and you have stunts going on because you're li- you know, their lives are in your hands and you yeah. want to make sure. So, you know, that everybody is safe. So that's another level of stress and concern that is just kind of, you have to push aside and go, got to make our day. You know, like I can't, I got to think about that stuff, but at the same time, I got to make sure that we get everything, but everyone's safe. So we went up, uh, up to the top floor and the drone operators there and we're doing this drone shot and everything, getting plates for the part where Elizabeth Derby falls off in a certain sequence. I'm not going to give it away. and then days later, I had the same. I had a dream where the building was about twenty floors higher. So, because if, if you watch the movie, uh, that building was only two floors, and we extended it. Oh, okay. so oh, that was thanks all the to effect. digital trickery, <laughs> um, we made it seem bigger. Because yeah. originally, in, if you look at the building, you'd go, eh, get a couple sprains if you fell off. You know, maybe a broken leg. You know, not a splat, splat. which is yeah. the desired effect. <laughs> but in my dream, I was 20 feet higher and I fell. I don't know how I fell. I think I was holding on to the drone. <laughs> I think I was just kind of like, come here, Michael Bay drone, and you know, like <laughs> grabbed it and I'm hanging from it and I fell. And I remember the dream specifically as I'm falling going, well, this is the part where I wake up, right? No, wait, no, this is the part. Wait, I'm not, I'm not, I'm I'm still falling and I'm not waking up and then splat. And I didn't wake up. And I remember specifically being like stuck in my body while I am flattened on like the your ground. broken body. My broken body. So you were just like, okay. like, like. I was mush. Yeah. <laughs> I, like I was cognizant like. cognizant mush. Like if you took silly putty and threw it against the wall, <laughs> that's how I felt. With mush. eyeballs. Yeah. Because <laughs> I, I, I've had dreams where, yeah, uh, they say like you wake up when you die in a dream. I've had dreams where I die and then it's like continue and it's like yeah, afterlife or something like that. But I don't think it's ever no, been I stuck in a broken stuck body. And there was no one around. And But I sat there and went, I knew I was in a dream. I went, well, it's the part where I wake up, guys. Hello. Hi. Anyone? Shit. And then that becomes like, yeah. wait, and, am I dreaming? And then you know how in, in dreams sometimes time is nebulous. You mm-hmm. know, like you, it could be you could fall asleep and wake up again and go, oh, my God, I felt like I was asleep for hours. Or the dream that I had felt like it was a, a Tolkien-esque epic. And then you realize, oh, no, I was only asleep for 30 seconds. Because yeah. those 90 minutes. Six yeah. cycles. Yeah. yeah. So I like when I was laying there, it felt like days that I was there. And who knows? I was probably just out for a couple minutes or an hour or whatever. But it's it's really interesting that time, even just the way that your your construct in your brain, how your dream is like uh remembered. Yeah. I used to write my dreams down. I was that kid that would write his dreams down. I had my little marble notebook and some of the best ideas that I've ever had came from those dreams, but you got to write them down immediately. Yeah, if or you, you lose them. We've talked about this. Oh and my I, God. I think that's why I don't remember so much because like every day I like have to wake up and just like get to it. You yeah. Know? Like, oh, I, I get to my workout that starts in like a half hour and mm-hmm. just like I have to jump out of bed. So I think it just gets purged from yeah. my brain. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, like I, so I would draw like draw or, you know, a gurnal immediately. <laughs> 
And those were, it's funny enough, like a lot of the um, the stuff that I've used in movies before have been from those dreams. Can you think of anything yeah, like, specifically? Uh, yeah. Um, the moment in Wrong Turn 2 where um, the, because uh, I have a, another fear of being hung upside down. Uh-huh. There's something about that that you feel so helpless, but I also don't like the point of view. Like there's something really like, weird about, about when you flip the world upside yeah. down, there's something really unnerving to me about that. Yeah. Um, uh, you guys see the remake of Candyman? Yeah. Yes. There's a couple sequences in that where she shoots the world upside yeah. down mm-hmm. and where, you know, Bernard Rose went overhead. Yep. She went upside down. Exactly. And I remember like watching that and that's all it took for me to be like, all right, I'm I'm freaked out now. Like there's when you're on like Disney rides or, or Universal rides and like that, you know, sometimes they'll do that where they'll like flip kind of the oh, world yeah. in front of you on the screen. Is that like more upsetting than the ride itself? For yes, you? very. But you only get little swatches of that. So it's yeah. that like Fle- that, that, that fleeting quickly. moment of terror. Yeah. Then then I'm back around again. And I go, oh, right. everything's fine. Yeah. Um, but I yeah, I remember specifically being uh, upside down and being so helpless and in. Uh, in Wrong Turn 2, there's a scene where uh, two characters are strung up and hanging. Uh, and then the whole time there's these two mutants that are like aiming for them. Yeah. And that's where the idea of shooting the whole scene upside down mm. so that but it looks right side up. Um, that's where that came from uh, completely. I remember that uh, it, the, the scene wasn't even written that way. Uh, and then after having that dream and having that like recollection of like, what can I make so that this feels as uncomfortable for the audience as possible? Yeah. Shoot it that way so that you can tell the blood is rushing to their heads. They're, they look like beats. And then when you set up the little construct of down below, mean, meanwhile, down there, father and son are ain't lining up a shot to kill them. And then you just leave it alone. You, It was almost like this is that moment in dreams when you're waiting for something to happen so that you wake up and then it never does. Mm-hmm. And for them, it's an arrow through both of their eyeballs. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, like a lot of that uh, shots usually, you know, come to mind um, when, I'm, when I'm dreaming. Uh, because again, like my brain is so wired to production and cr- like film construction that I can't not get that out of my head. Yeah. I actually have been told that I direct on set in my dr- in my sleep. Huh. Yeah, like I I wait I am a talker in in my sleep. <laughs> and uh in most cases I'm laying there and I'm going, "Yeah, that was great. Yeah, Crampton, can you move over to the right a little bit? <laughs> yeah, we're going to go back to one on that. Uh yeah, hold on. Uh wait, what time's lunch?" Like I will have full conversations with the crew and the cast in my sleep like all the time. You're sleeping on set? Just, no, 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 like no, no, like in like, like while I'm sleeping. Recreating oh, it. Yeah. Oh, okay. I don't I like see. it happens especially when I'm in production. Yeah, I yeah. Like, I will come home and you clock. think mm-hmm. like I'm going to decompress. Yeah. Throw an episode of Scrubs on. Sure. You know, just kind of not think about things and just fall asleep and try to get some sleep. Nope. I my brain is still moving. Oh, a hundred percent. And and when and when I recall like I don't remember any of that production stuff that was going on in my head, mm-hmm. but clearly I've had many conversations about you know like no we got to go again oh <laughs> god damn it like like all right back to one you know and i will have those conversations all the time well those are what my nightmares are often like where it's like things that could happen likely wouldn't happen but very well could and mm-hmm. would be horrible and it's things like i'll be on set and not be prepared like one time i was i was asked to go on stage and i then play a violin i don't know how to play the violin and like and they gave me a pillow to hold and play it was like i don't know <laughs> a like, pillow yeah i don't know why like that was it like, would it would produce so a very like, interesting sound yeah, yeah so i had to go up on stage and like play this but again they're just like anxiety dreams of yeah. like being unprepared or not knowing and i and i think like what you're saying it comes from this like over stimulus that we have in our lives mm-hmm. but then also in the industry that we work in it's so high pressure all the time especially when you're the director you a know bit. Yeah. because uh, no it is because you're you're in you're not only responsible for yourself but like you talked about everybody else and everybody has invested so much time and yeah. money and faith in you that like your brain has to process it somehow and we can't be in therapy every single day no that, that's a really good point like because especially like when you're when you are the director on a film or a TV show or whatever um I've been 
there's there's a term below the line, you mm-hmm. know, where you're someone who is not either the director or the producer or like the DP or whatever. You are there to be part of the crew, but, you know, you're not like one of the big wigs. And sometimes that's great because <laughs> the pressure's off. You can, you know, you still want to do a good job, be on standby, help everybody out as much mm-hmm. as you can in your department or sometimes outside of the department. Yeah. Um, but the pressure's off. When you're like, you know, one of those kind of number ones, um, the the pressure is daunting and you never want to come across as if um, you don't know what you're doing or um, that you're insecure at all, yeah. that you don't have your three steps ahead because uh-huh. you always have to think that way. Um, so I, uh, whenever, like whether I'm in a 15 pass van going to set or I'm driving myself or what have you, um, I try to listen to music that like gets me riled up okay um you know, in a good way yeah. you know but also just allows me to kind of be on because if you and i've been on sets where the director isn't on and it's it's not the kind of thing that you like to be part of if if you will like you want someone who's got the confidence that, that they know what they're they're doing that um you know th- that they're also nice Mm -hmm. you know there's nothing worse than being on set and the director's an asshole um shut up i'm just saying all you back there (laughs) watch it um no but but being on means that you are stuffing down a lot of anxiety um i used to do you guys know what french hours are no for production so french hours are when you eradicate lunch from the schedule So it's basically you have working lunches, right? It usually means that you have less hours and the crew loves it because, you know, they're usually portal, portal, to portal. They are, you know, 10 hours instead of 12. Yeah. And in most cases, the crew is thrilled because they're not stuck there on set. Um, This became much bigger uh, during COVID, you know, and and sometimes beyond. It's it's a cost saving measure, but it's also something that some people love. Um, I didn't do it until um, I was in Serbia shooting Everly um, uh-huh. because the, the Serbians love their French hours. Uh, they also love meat, a lot of sausage for lunch. <laughs> oh, sausage. Um, but, but you're also, you're, you're, it's walking lunches too. So you don't yeah. get any break periods. So you just eat while you're going. It's like permanent Exa- crafty. What they would do is they would, exactly. Um, but crafty with a lot of sausage. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. I came out sausage wrong, crap. but you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> But the the thing is, so they would have like certain departments like leave, you know, or they would uh, like let certain members of that department go off and get food and then come back and everything. Uh, for a director, it's usually like someone will come and, you know, grab your food and bring it to you. And then you're sitting there eating away. I got to admit, I needed I missed those hours, like that hour of lunch, mm-hmm. uh-huh. because that was the moment where I got to stop being on huddle off in the corner, realize, oh shit, I still have X amount of shots to do and we wasted too much time pontificating in the beginning of the day. Essentially, it was a moment of rest from being on. Yeah. And... The um, and I needed it. Like I found that, like when we were st- we started doing French hours on another show, and I was like, I really missed having that moment where I could. And I and I felt terrible not um, being like commiserating with the crew and hanging out. I used to, I also loved having having lunch with the crew and hanging yeah. out. But when you're the director, you also don't have a lot of time to hang out and mm-hmm. talk about like who, what what are you guys doing this weekend and shit. Yeah. Um. So I needed that that off time. When I didn't have it, my dreams were a lot worse. Mm. But now it makes sense, though, because like I needed almost like a um, a breather to like, process. Exactly, Your brain needed to reset. Do you know the movie uh, Summer School? No, I'm not familiar with it. Wow, guys, are we on the same page? Roy's like, no, yes, no, 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 <laughs> no, no. And you know, I, and side note, I can't stand it when when people go, "You've never seen Summer School? How dare you? You guys are lucky because." If you haven't seen it, it's a Carl Reiner movie uh, with Mark Harmon. Uh, it came out in 87. It's one of my favorite comedies of all time. And part of that is there was a character in the movie named Chainsaw, played by Dean Cameron, <laughs> who was us basically in high school, was reading Fangoria, had, you know, severed heads in their uh, their locker, I fake severed heads. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, the reason why I bring that up is there's a moment in the movie where um, Chainsaw just screams in the middle of a class and he goes, 
tension breaker had to be done. And I tried that once oh, God. on a shoot. I let people know, but I tried it and you, it, it's very therapeutic. But otherwise you don't have- Was it just you screaming or did anyone else get in? No, no, too? I made everybody else do oh, it too. Oh, okay, all right. No, no. I thought it was just like, everyone else was like uh, setting up for a shot, doing their job. And, and I, you, you just, just hear screaming. screaming. And everyone's like, what the fuck, Joe? Come on. My mother <laughs> no, no, has I, made me do that. Really? Uh, yeah, uh, there was there Release. were times, I mean, it still happens, but very early in my career where I was just saying yes to everything and like driving back and forth from like all up and down New York, like from one set to the next, like, like not having days like off. No money probably. Yeah, no money, yep. struggling with like, like, like everybody else situations. in New York. Yeah. yeah, and my mom, I would be like on in the car, like crying to my mom, and she'd be like, I need you to just yell. Just start screaming. <laughs> it will, like, and it would work. It would, like, reset me to be able to, like, walk in and, like, keep it together. But that's that's something that if I didn't have, like, now I'm, I'm having this epiphany with you guys. This is, <laughs> act, like, this is amazing, actually. Oh, I love it. Um, that maybe my the way that my brain processes all of my anxieties and all of my fears is through those dreams because otherwise I don't have downtime. I don't yeah. like, you know, in the morning I have usually I get up at five or six, you know, I have those three hours where no emails are coming in, no phone calls are coming in. You can actually get writing done. You can get stuff done that you might've missed the day before. Like the pressure's off. The second that like, you know, New York has opened up. Mm -hmm. It's like, ah, oh, shit. And then when you know LA and all the offices are opening up and all the emails start coming, oh, yeah. then it's like, oh my God, like yeah. I can feel myself getting tenser. Yeah. And it doesn't stop until maybe eight or nine, you know, PM. And then I can finally shut down a little bit. But by that point, we want to watch a movie. And next thing I know, I'm passed out. Mm -hmm. Like, and I can't yeah. stand that. But my brain needs some way to process that. And I think it's the dreams and just the, the few hours of sleep that I have that allow me to kind of deal with it when my like my on self can't do it during the day. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, it is it's such a high pressure thing. I always talk about how half the job being on set and when you're when you're top of the call sheet mm -hmm. in any capacity, whether you're the producer, the director, the actor, it, the writer even is getting the next job too oh, God. because like you're you're trying to accomplish something mm -hmm. but then you're also trying to make everybody like you so that you can get this next job yeah and i mean i guess i think i really do when does that happen for you though when like does it like in terms of this because there's let's say we have a 20-day shoot yeah. right um when does that nervousness about that next job start for you in the very first few days and the very last few days. I don't know the how first it is few you. days. Yeah, the first I mean, oh, for me, man, I, I feel fucking like a million bucks. I, I, in the first the couple first days. Few days, I'm like everybody. And maybe this is just like a people pleaser thing, but it's like mm. everybody must like me. So I oh, make it my okay. point to like I have to learn every single person's name. Oh, yeah, so I will like I'll start like drilling myself, you know, mm. like so that by like day two, day three, I have everybody, mm -hmm. uh, even if it's especially if it's like a big crew, you know, yeah. and then um, and then, then I start to feel comfortable and you get in your rhythm and you're yeah. joking and you're having fun. And then the last like week, I'm like, oh shit, now, you know what I mean? Was I was I difficult here? Oh, like I ran late this day. Yeah. Oh, I flubbed this this day. You know, then it starts like, and nobody's start thinking about it. that. No, no nobody one has is. that. We yeah. are, mm -hmm. like reflectively, yeah. we're beating ourselves up. Uh, yeah, for me, it's like the last three or four days when you know the key grip when he comes up to you and goes, so what do you got going on next? I'm like, oh shit, I hate it's that. begun, <laughs> I it's hate begun. That. And I know half of that is, hey, can you hire me for yeah. another day? <laughs> yeah. you know, you're like, Nobody's no, about dude, you. not right now. Yeah. Like, like, let, let's focus on this shit. It, it's gotta be different as a director, like unique as a director, just cause like as an actor, when when the job's over, it's over and, and you do have to move on to something else. With the director, when the shoot's over, you're yeah. gonna have to sit in on the editing and mm -hmm. then you're gonna have to do all the PR and stuff. So uh, Suitable Flesh was your, your last project. Yes. Have you, are you still in that mindset of it or are you already thinking of the next thing? Oh, well, in terms of the, because with the, with the press, it was um, pretty much just me for a while. Yeah. And uh -huh. then Dennis uh, Paoli, our writer, mm -hmm. once the writer strike lifted, um, then he got to jump into the fray. And, um, you know, we, we needed to do it no matter what. Like it was terrible timing in this situation. I mean, it needed to happen, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, it was like, 
but our movie's coming out and yeah. all my actors uh. are really proud of the movie and they want to talk about yeah. it and this really sucks and I felt terrible but at the same time work had to be done you yeah. know someone had to do the dog and pony show so um in terms of like winding down from that a little bit um you know now i'm glad that the movie has come out i'm glad that the movie has been very well received it seems like people are watching it which is crazy um we've gone now <laughs> it's it's a weird balance though because we've gone from the um festival fever mm -hmm. where there's the exclusivity of people uh -huh. seeing it at a festival and being able to you know tell their friends and then then their friends get to see it when yeah. it comes out wide and it, they're it's all no going longer like, a thing that people are just like talking about yeah. something yeah. that Have everyone can go yeah. see exactly and, and order from home and watch on their couch and uh -huh. everybody can see it and, yeah. that, and sometimes you know that you can't please everybody exactly yeah. and the people who are going to festivals they're going to have a different uh calibrated taste yeah about mm -hmm. uh movies they might be open to things that are stranger or as outside opposed to wheelhouse. someone who's casually scrolling through vod and they see the thumbnail they're like and they oh heather graham like, yeah i love Boogie uh, Nights. Yeah. exactly well if they like Boogie yeah. Nights, i love like bowfinger this yeah, is probably yeah. <laughs> just like bowfinger right <laughs> Do you read your uh, Do you read your letterbox? Because of course I do. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I I'm, I'm controversial when it comes to that. I respond you to respond. people. Do you? You're goddamn you, right. You get in oh trouble for it. I get I get I in trouble for responding to tweets. I don't about get me. in trouble. <laughs> no, no, I no. I will not. I will not. I refuse. I have learned that whenever someone trolls, mm -hmm. the best defense to it is kill them with kindness. You yeah. Oh, uh. dude. 100%. I've actually had rev like reviews that have gone up a star. Yeah. Because, and you know what? In the end, because you were so it's, nice it's just an it. algorithm. You know, it's like if, yeah. if that gets it up a, a star, great. And I've made friends on there that would have been like, perfect example. This movie sucks. Goat balls. <laughs> oh, man. You know what? I I love goat balls, but I'm really sorry that you, know, you didn't like it. Hey, to each their own, you know, yeah. like a nice little letter saying, but mm -hmm. I really appreciate you. Oh, shit. I didn't realize you were going to read this. Right. Actually, I thought the movie was great. I'm like, <laughs> oh then what happened to the goat balls? I'll get mean comments and then reply in a similar manner. And then uh, my favorite response is when the people respond being like, oh, James, I'm sorry. My little brother got on my account and left that comment. I'm like, no, all right, but yeah. yeah, sometimes people just need a little bit of confrontation yeah. and it'll maybe make them second guess their behavior. Well, I think online. that that is something that has obviously the internet and the, um, the boundaries that the internet has gained us has changed the dynamic of people being able to comment on things. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, there was somebody who was like really mean about the movie last week. Um, about Suitable Flesh? About Suitable Flesh, oh, no. like really nasty. Now, I can't control if you don't like a movie for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If, But I will get a little chafed over someone saying that the movie is poorly made. Yeah. You know, it's like, this is a terribly made movie. Yeah. I'm like, they didn't even try. Mm. It's like, yeah, like, no, it's like, we did. this looks like shit. And like, it's crafted crappily. I'm like, and, and I, it takes a lot for me to say, you try it. You know, it's like, you don't want to be <laughs> yeah. that, that douchey. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but when, you know, somebody did it last week where they were just railing on how poorly made the movie was not that they didn't like it, but that this movie was like utter crap and it was the worst movie they've ever, worst made movie they've ever seen. Not a fan of irises, maybe? Maybe not, yeah. <laughs> no no split screens, I don't know. Or those um, split diopter shots. But so when I wrote them back and I said, you know, I'm really sorry that th it didn't work for you, um, yada, 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 I did the whole spiel. And then he immediately wrote back and said the same thing where he was like, I, I didn't realize that you were gonna be on here. I thought that, you know, like the directors didn't, you know, engage and stuff like that. And then by the end of this back and forth, we're giving each other advice on on movies that we haven't seen before. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think that once you establish, look, I know that a lot of people say like once they make a movie, it's like I can't read the reviews and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, there is part of me and I don't know if this is a masochistic side of me, but like I want to have people enjoy the movie or be engaged with the movie. If you don't like it, and I've seen plenty of movies that I haven't liked, yeah. you know, but I can still, I'll never forget this, like um, watching The Toxic Avenger for the first time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And thinking like, now I knew back when I first saw it, this is movies not for everybody. Yeah. yeah. But <laughs> God damn it, those guys got that movie made. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that is no easy task. It is incredibly stressful to make a movie and it's so easy to cut some something down with a couple comments without realizing like the the work and the stress that goes into it. Um, so yes, I do read them. Uh, I've had to pull back a little bit because there's just been such a freaking deluge of 
like yeah. reviews and comments over the past week that I like I've been pulling back a little bit just for my own sanity. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, but I want to know how it's doing. You for know, sure. I think yeah, I feel like we, we're very similar in that yeah. regard. It, it, and there's I don't think there's anything like um, self-serving about it. I don't think it's an egotistical thing. I think it's just when you when you are making a movie, you don't get very often to have gone are the days where you would like you'd hear about um, people driving around in L.A. and go, go from to theater premieres. to yeah. theater yeah. to theater to hear, hear the, the audience. audience. Yeah. You know, we've been lucky so where cool. we've been able to see the movie um, at a lot of festivals yeah. and stuff like that. And, you know, um, a, a couple times, like when we've been to some screenings, I think the last two, I just couldn't sit through them anymore because I still see all the flaws. Okay. Always, um, every time. But I, you know, in most cases, I like to sit in there just to kind of gauge the temperature because every audience is different. You yeah. know, an audience that's there for a USC screening with a bunch of students is going to be completely different than a paying crowd on a mm-hmm. Friday night yeah. at the Alamo Draft House. They're just going to have different energies and yeah. they're going to laugh at different things. and They're going to be affected by different things. And I want to know that as to make myself a better storyteller. Yeah. I want to know what works yeah. and what doesn't. The Th- student crowd. Sorry, go ahead. No, go no ahead. please go ahead. <laughs> I'm just gonna no, say, no, go ahead, guys. No, Joe, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Through reading all these letterbox reviews, you have a bunch of data you know, that yeah. you're pulling about yes, people's reactions. my own personal algorithm. So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and what kind of things have stood out to you that people have said about Suitable Flesh as far as, like, things that a lot of people have said they like or things that a lot of people have said doesn't work for them? Anything, like, stick out to you? Because when I read comments on videos, yeah. after a while, you start to notice yes. the recurring things, yeah. like the, the mode comment, the, you know, the, the most Like the bell curve of it. Yeah, right? and it's like, oh, a lot of people are talking about this joke or this line, so. Well, fu- funny enough, um, and this is where I appreciate where the comments um, diverge is that a lot of times it's the same thing that some person will love mm-hmm. that another person will say, nope, not like oh, that's not for fun. me. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. That's That to me is good constructive criticism about a film mm-hmm. yeah. because, you know, whatever baggage you are bringing into a movie, good, bad, or otherwise, you had a bad day at work or you just don't like these types yeah. of movies and your friend put it on or what have you, or you don't like that actor or that director yeah. sucks, or I love that what, what, what that director is doing. Everybody's going to fuel their, you know, version of their viewing experience differently. Mm-hmm. I can't control that at all. Um, I just hope that, you know, whatever works for them works. Yeah. In in the case of uh, Suitable Flesh, especially from like just reviews and also mm-hmm. Letterboxd and stuff, um, you know, some people love the eroticism and the horniness of it. Yeah. Some people are just like, nope, that does not work for me. Really? You know? Or, um, you know, the <laughs> like, very nah. deliberate. Well, <laughs> it's into. funny. Like some people. I <laughs> not think, into it. Like what? Well, there is this the, current there's, conversation, there's going a, on, especially a, with younger yeah. audiences. A current dialogue that's saying 18 to 24 uh, young adults do not would would prefer a platonic camaraderie amongst characters as opposed to getting it hot and heavy between two of your uh-huh. protagonists. Okay, that's, you know, like I can't fix that, but I also know that there is an audience mm-hmm. who does want to see a little uh, yeah. Roland Z. Hay, if you will. <laughs> Roland um, Z. Hay. Uh, but in, in terms of, <laughs> yes, well, direct quote from the film, that's a direct quote from, uh, what is it, uh, Young Frankenstein. Oh, okay. Yeah. Was okay. like a Roland Z. Hay? Yes, yeah. Yeah, that, I just basically used Jonathan Check as my avatar to get really dumb jokes in there. Um, is that somebody, why he's so hunky? Because he's modeled yeah. that for you? Yes, yeah. that's it. I, if, if I could have the idealized version of myself, yeah. it would be Jonathan Check walking around that set all day in his underwear. Well, yeah. I mean, okay. So Perfect you... amount of chest hair. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. He hated it. He, he hated did? it. Have you ever seen Jonathan Check's Instagram? No. No. Is it waxed top to bottom? He is, he's as bears baby's body. Really? He didn't want to be hairy. That's so that, No, no, no. That was my thing. That you I, wanted him to Look, have... I, I am a uh, a very hairy man, you know, as you can probably and you tell. you find it erotic. Your suit. Yes. Well, we wanted to have two, <laughs> we wanted to have a dichotomy. Yes, I, I literally look like I'm in the middle of a werewolf transformation. I'm the time. opposite. I have zero hair. You want some? Yeah. I got I some extra for tra- you. Yeah. I will, I will find be a nice more than video. happy to give you a Wax Lynch Merkin. You know, out, Honest, of, out of my my uh, my werewolf. Honestly, it, it kills me because I know that Chelsea likes chest hair, and I'm like, I got nothing for you. I got oh, a few really? strands on my nipples, and that's it. And like oh. like a tiny little patch can, in the but middle. She loves I can hook you, you up, anyway. and she does. Oh. And that, bless her for it with my bare chest. <laughs> well, with, with Jonathan, uh, well, just with the characters, I wanted to have a dichotomy between those two characters. Oh, sure. So yeah, to yeah. have like you know, especially going into like almost like 
you know, a queer sensibility to have like the twink and the bear mm -hmm. on either side. Yeah. I wanted to have that that contrast. Yeah. So I told Jonathan, like, after I texted him and said, like, do you want to be in the movie? He goes, fuck, yeah. And then I'm like, you can't shave your chest. And then it was dot, 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 <laughs> gone. dot, 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 gone, dot, dot, dot. Do I have to? I'm like, <laughs> yes, like, trust me, it's worth it. Like, I want to have there be a contrast between you two. And he was so mad. Like the day that he That's knew so that he wasn't going to have to take his shirt off anymore, gone. Like he was, wow, <laughs> whacking away. Did he know? change his opinion after seeing the movie and seeing how great he looks? Uh, I mean, I guess he did. I would hope so. <laughs> yeah. You know, I know that a lot of people have complimented him on that. And then, yeah. then you go to his Instagram and he's in all these like bodybuilding contests and shit like that. <laughs> Zero. He's got like negative 10 body fat and it's oh just all God. rippled Perfect muscles. Friend. He looks like the Hulk. It's crazy, but yeah. that like, and then you see Judah, and that's a whole different contrast. Uh -huh. But that was the whole point: was yeah. to yeah. make sure that it, physically they are not who they seem to be. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and and the last thing with that is in the script, uh, the the in the original script, uh, Jonathan Sheck's character was written to be a lot more schlubby. Yeah, and I'm like, well. Then it's going to be easy for the audience to go, well, look at the, you know, young nubile uh, piece of flesh over yeah. there. That makes sense. I wanted it to be hard. Some of my favorite I, I comments. you last night yes. while watching the movie. Some of my favorite comments <laughs> have been like, why the hell did she do that when she had Jonathan Sheck shirtless <laughs> all the time? And I'm like, good. But you know, That's how you should be feeling then about Then you it. should be, yeah. that, that means you're invested in it. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. And if you can do one of those, like, what would I do in that situation? Then we've done our job. Yeah, hundred percent. Was there uh, how much steaminess did you edit out of the film, or is oh. what we see what you shot? Um, no, there was uh, there was a, a, a more thrusts, if you will. Okay, um, you know that we wanted to be YouTube hates thrusts. Oh, so yeah, I don't know no, if you, no. yeah, 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 if it, like the, not big, not big fans of the thrusts. No, like, is there like a thrust thrust thrust. Thrust. Like you know how there's yeah, like a, one like and an you're F done. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's like an F word. Like you know, like when you're uh, that's another question. Did you submit? When you're submitting to the to the ratings board, mm -hmm. yeah. did you have to think about this? Because I, I know that you, like myself, come from the the trauma world where it's mm -hmm. like they won't even submit because they know <laughs> yeah. that it's not gonna it's not gonna fly. It's not gonna yeah. pass. And there's like a certain amount of f words you can use, and there's also a certain amount of female nudity that yeah. you can show, which is also like such a weird thing. Like and get a certain rating. Um, male nudity is like more objective. Yeah. Did you try to get? Yeah, but did you try to hang on at all? Or? Rather. Uh, well. That was something because again, the whole movie is uh, is well at least the the big flashback is all from Heather's perspective, yeah. you know. So yeah. you know, and and it's funny too because I've had people say like, "Where's all the boobs?" You know, like what what happened to all the female nudity? I'm like, and which is funny because this kind of brings us back to dreams. Whenever I dream that I'm in an erotic situation, I'm not thinking about my butt, you know, or, or, or I'm not visualizing <laughs> yeah. my extremities sure. at all oh, like yeah, yeah. i am i am eroticizing the partner or mm -hmm. partners yeah. hey. um, <laughs> but for this you know because this was her perspective and it was her it was her version of the story in in her own dream logic sort of way it felt like well she's going to objectify the men more mm -hmm. than the women yeah and i did have it, it's funny i think one of the first conversations that i had with um judah about the sexuality of it, um, he was like, so are we gonna go full frontal? And I think he was saying that as if it was like a deal breaker, because we were talking a lot yeah. about like how we were gonna portray the sex very yeah. honestly and yeah. hopefully very sexily. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. um, and They did sex when, sexily. Sex sexily. Oh, we, we, got, we got very sexily. Um, <laughs> That sounds like an app. It should be an app. Sexually, Sexily, right? Yeah. It's like the new dating alternative. Yeah, it's for, like sex or, period or, ly. Or it's like Uber Eats for sex. Sex. Oh, oh, oh that's, that's, that's a whole that's a Vegas. That's a whole, yeah, that's a Vegas thing. Uh, yeah, that's yeah, a Vegas thing. I feel thing. like that's only legal in Nevada. <laughs> um, but when he asked that, that was almost like I was kind of taking that. He was taking the temperature of mm -hmm. how far we were going to go. And like, <laughs> I can only think of one movie, maybe aside from, uh, I think it was Shame, that Michael Fassbender movie where he he went full dong, mm -hmm. um, which was Wild Things, which was one of the movies that we watched, yeah. uh, the um, Kevin Bacon. Um, Matt Dillon. Yeah, Matt and Dillon mm -hmm. movie that was like a film noir that John McNaughton directed from Henry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and the, the infamous like shot of Kevin Bacon's full bacon, full uh, bacon. when he comes out of the shower. Uh, his sausage, if you will, yeah. the bacon sausage. Um, and I remember they made such a big deal about that. 
And it wasn't erotic at all. It yeah. just felt like it was there just to be there. And I like when Judah asked that, I, I kind of had to say in the room from the jump, like, I, cause I didn't want to lose him. Mm -hmm. I was like, no, I don't want to do that. You know, cause I, I know that that would have run us into certain censorship issues. Yeah. Well, yeah. I talk about this a lot. Like it's this kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't thing mm -hmm. with, with nudity, particularly with women. So I, I really appreciated that it was kind of the opposite yeah. in Suitable Flesh. But like for women, it's this whole like thing where it's like, ex it's it's one of two things. You're, it's expected. Um, you're, I don't think I've, I've met a woman where it hasn't come up in her career mm. at all. And and again, it's like, if you, if you, if you don't do it, it's like, Oh well, she's not really an artist. You yeah. know, she's not willing to really go there. The passive aggressive you know? shaming. Yeah, mm -hmm. but then if you do do, it's like she doesn't really take her art that seriously, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But then if you do do it, it's like you know what? She's not very bright. She doesn't really take herself that seriously. So you're kind of screwed either way, yeah. right? And nobody's ever thinking like, but what does this mean for like the context of the story if yeah. we do it or if we don't yeah. do it? It's just about like the actor themselves. And mm -hmm. what I loved about Suitable Flesh is it was kind of. It was the opposite of that. It was much about like, what does showing this mean for the story? And because like you said, it's her perspective. You're not really sh featuring the female nudity as heavily as you are the male nudity. Anytime that there's female nudity in it, it was almost by accident, you know? Yeah, it was a heat of the moment moment, you yeah. know? And I would much rather be able to per personify that and get the actor's permission, like do doing that than I mean, I, I've been on sets before where there's, you know, copious amounts of nudity mm -hmm. and it's not sexy at all. Like it's the shoot it's, itself. It, yeah, yeah, for sure. It's no, not fun. No, they never are. Yeah. No, it's, it's an incredibly uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the, the ironic part is that ne like you're supposed to be conveying spontaneity and chemistry. It's so and choreographed. there's nothing worse than like having to direct people that are not really comfortable in that yeah. situation. Sometimes they are, you know. Did you have an intimacy coordinator for Suitable Flesh? No, but we asked everybody um, that was gonna be involved in that um, if they wanted one, you mm -hmm. know, cause we said we're more than willing to. Yeah. Um, at that point, we had talked to every single department, like like uh, every single like representative for every actor. Um, I wrote up like a 32 page document, a legal document that said exactly how we were gonna shoot it. I shot storyboards mm -hmm. um, that showed them like, how much butt crack, how much under boob, yeah, all that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and at that point, um, you know, Heather, Judah, uh, Jonathan, all three of them were like, no, I like, I think we're good. Yeah. They just like Jonathan, trusted you, I guess? Yeah, okay. Suckers. Um, <laughs> no, no. But like whenever you do, and I'm, I'm sure you've dealt with this before yeah. too, when, you know, when it comes to those scenes, a closed set is like so important. Yeah. You know? Critical. Uh, there's nothing worse than having a bunch of people standing around eating sandwiches and watching, you know, things go down. It's like, hey, hey, sexy time. And you got, you know, Phil, Phil the Grip is just sitting there like chomping away at shit. Mm -hmm. um, Especially not with smartphones and you're never sure like, is someone exactly. like, you know, sneaking something? We, like we kept our sets uh, to the actors, the DP who was the camera person at the time or another camera person, uh, uh, Laura, who was our B camera person and me, and that was it. And then mm -hmm. the sound guy was usually like on the other side of the room, turned or in the, like in another room. Yeah. And we just mic'd it in a way. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and you know, the, the that to me is I think the most conducive way to create chemistry. Um, but when it comes to the safety and the consent of the actors, um, we asked them all and they, they politely declined saying like, we feel like we're in good hands with you and the producers. We know that you've given us full transparency and, you know, and from there it was just one extra person, you know, on set. And I have been on sets with intimacy coordinators and look, nice people, they're doing their jobs in more times than not. They have made the situation more uncomfortable. Really? Yeah. Oh, they, like, Yes. I like Do you as, think what they're over talking it or uh, like oh they, like oh one hundred percent like yeah. they are. There's a difference between Phil the Grip who's sitting there eating his sandwich mm -hmm. and someone who is staring at the scene at what's going on right behind camera and like going oh I, we got we should talk about that oh, um you know are you fine with this like breaking the scene yeah, up I've see. actually been okay. on a set wasn't mine but mm -hmm. I was on a set where the intimacy coordinator again. They are doing their job, and mm -hmm. in this, I'm sure, yeah. very from in this person. climate, exactly yeah. in this climate right now, 
it's something that just needed to be done yeah. years ago. Yeah. Um, but this was a situation where the intimacy coordinator was doing everything in their power to make it as as the, the least intimate possible mm -hmm. between the, the actors. Like I could tell they were uncomfortable because it was just everything was being scrutinized. I you know, see. again, yeah. to to their, you know, the, the person was doing it for their safety. Yeah. But I think at the same time they were like, hurting the scene a little bit. And then I watched the scene and I went like, yeah, there was nothing sexy about that. It's a little too much yeah. tunnel vision on on this specific job rather than keeping the whole thing in yes. mind as well. You know, it, yeah. like in in effect, I think in terms of an intimacy coordinator, that's kind of the director's job. If you care about those actors and you care about your crew too, but yeah. if you care about your actors in that scene, you need to protect your actors. That's your family. Yeah. And if you care about their safety and their consent, you got to be as communicative on every level, including those intimate scenes. If you don't, then you're probably not going to get a good scene. But more importantly, you're not going to have your actors trust you. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, when it comes if the intimacy coordinator is there, great. If, they, if it's going to make their reps or their lawyers or even them more comfortable that there is a presence there, fine. But at the end of the day. As a director, you have to protect your actors. And in, and in the end, you get a sexy scene. We have to wrap up soon, but we ask people oh boy. on this show, so one last question, what their nightlight is. And what we mean by that is, what is the thing that amidst all the dark and challenging things, be it on set or in your nightmares or just that like keeps you up at night, what is the light at the end of the tunnel? What is the thing that keeps you moving, keeps you going, even when when you're struggling? Wow, good question. <laughs> um, honestly, um, it's it's hard because you know when right now I'm in a mindset that has been so fraught with so much going on mm -hmm. in my personal life, in my professional life. It has been, um, it's been, it's been a very wild six months, you know, like yeah. it's been a wild year and a half with this project. Um, I've learned a lot about myself. I've learned a lot about other people in, in good ways, some bad. Um, where's, where's Barbara? Is she here? Did you say Barbara Crampton? I did. That's so funny because I feel like I can, I can sense her. Yeah, it feels like there's a suitable presence in the room. A suitable pleasure. It, it, it's, it's like enjoyable. It's it's pleasurable. Yeah, it's, it's more than suitable. It's <laughs> kind of moist. Yeah, it um, is. It's a little damp in here. Yeah. A little hot, a little sticky. How about you guys? I'm getting a little hot under the, under the collar. I'm getting a little hot under the Crampton. Under oh. the cramp. Uh, is that? Is she? I feel like. Whoa! Whoa! I'm here. I've arrived. Hi, boss. <laughs> Hello, Wait, have you come to give me notes? Because the movie's done. There's, I love the movie. There's no more. Okay, phew, thank God. Yeah, so. This is how Barbara would show up at our edit room. She would literally just bamf and just pop in. We'd be like, "What's that smell? It smells like, it smells like Crampton." Poof. <laughs> Usually yeah. with like Erwan, a lot, a yeah, lot of, a lot yes. of oh artisanal my God. cheeses. Everybody discovered Erwan Great. because I can't not go there. I spend a lot. <laughs> Believe of money. me, I'd like yeah. you guys would leave, and there would be all these delicious cheeses. I'm just like, mm -hmm. man, I love uh, the edit we had process. A lot of cheeses when we were editing the movie, right? I used to bring a lot of cheese. Now yeah. when people say like this movie's very cheesy, and I'm no. like, oh. oh, that yeah, that's why it was added yeah. in post. Uh, yes, right. yeah, lots of fromage. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, we're talking about dreams and nightmares and mm -hmm. things like that, and um, you know, I've told these guys before that I have prophetic dreams. Like I dream things. And then they happen a couple of years later. And I go, oh yeah, I dreamt about that. Okay. That happened has happened to me my whole life. Like I know what's coming. My future She's is a psychic. very bright. I'm a little psychic <laughs> and, and it happens in my dreams. Anyway, I had a dream about you way before I met you. What? <laughs> Get out of here. Way before. I mean, I knew who you were. But I was living in San Francisco at the time. This okay. was like, I don't know, maybe four or five years ago. And I actually had a sex dream about you. <gasps> <gasps> oh, that's not where I thought this was going. Oh my gosh. I, but I know where it's coming. <laughs> I totally 
Tell me more, and I boss. Did. No, but is this, this is... sexual harassment? Oh wait, we're not technically working together right now. No, this so. is fine. Yes, <laughs> this is so. Keep going. This is so weird. I've not told anyone this. What an I'm exclusive! I know. We're but so lucky here. It, on I had I'm getting a, a little. I had. A, <laughs> I had Fist. a hot this sex dream about you. This like, might be the most it was excited a hot one I've too. ever gotten on this show. If this doesn't get mad hits, I'm going to be really fucking angry right now. <laughs> we were having sex. Okay, keep going. And it was really good. Well, thank <laughs> God. Oh, thank God. Okay, well, and, well, I, and I woke up in the morning. I was like, wow, that was awesome. Wow. Anyway, cut to a few years later. And I no no go back no. To, go back to the other stuff please I need <laughs> no. details it's a prophetic no, but actually, dream <laughs> I think the oh first God. time I actually met you was when I was on your podcast and yeah. you invited me had I been was had we done um had we done the TV show yet though no no that was before oh no yeah no us on uh, movie crypt was uh, like two or three years before maybe yeah it was in okay. 2018 so I was holding that in what I met that was the first time I saw you in person and I was like. But there's something about this is that. this is a lot to process because yeah. how many times I've <laughs> masturbated so to you <laughs> over the years? Thank you. Like yeah. I mean, look, it's become like a, a common joke, you know. At this point, when yeah. I know you guys are just like totally <laughs> you go. shocked. This is great. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this is the look, best I, moment I think I've ever seen on this. I show. found myself as a man many times thanks to Barbara Crampton. I can I can name three movies that I had there. There's the a Animator lot of tracking from, lines yeah. in a lot of those VHS tapes between Reanimator, Body Double, and From Beyond. Oh, oh yeah. No now ball. cut to yeah, but Chopping Mall. I don't think I masturbated to her head exploding. <laughs> uh, no, was, her, no, my head didn't, her head explode. didn't explode. Everybody thinks it's you my head. That fan. that what's that girl's name? I can't remember her name, but no, I I died in the fire. Mm -hmm. Oh, there that's was a right. Can of fire, Susie. Susie Slater? It's, it's Susie think, something, yeah. Susie yeah. is her name, I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't masturbate to her either, so don't worry. No. Like, don't get jealous. Yeah. But no, I, yeah, I, I found a lot of the sexy feels thanks to you. I found myself okay. as a- as a. How, how young were you when you watched Reanimator? Was that the first movie you saw that I was in? Yeah. Yeah, how, how old were you? Oh. Yeah, I was. I was just yes. starting to get the the, the feels. Okay. Yeah, the, the little little boners were, yeah. were starting to we'll sprout up, oh if you will. God. Well, I I feel like that. Okay, I didn't have a prophecy that we were going to work together, but the dream was Your so vivid and so sexy that it kind of made sense to me that you are the director of Suitable Flesh and you brought sexy back to cinema. You're the you're the yeah. Justin I'm, Timberlake. I'm still you can't. <laughs> I'm still processing you're all never, this. You're never Justin stumped, Timberlake and right you're now. never like, oh my god, I don't know what to say. Like <laughs> until right now, until right now. Yeah, there was a yeah. moment when we were in Kansas City uh, and we showed um, From Beyond. Yeah, and it was this brand new 4K transfer. Fest. Yes, mm -hmm. a Panic Fest, and uh, it was a brand new 4K print. Barbara sitting next to me. Becca was next to to. Uh, me on the other side and I'm like I have these two beautiful women you know, I'm watching this movie and then if you've seen From Beyond oh yeah, yeah. Barbara wears quite the BDSM yeah. mm -hmm. costume yeah. which and I sold at a yard sale I mean talk about sexy on. movie you yeah. sold it at a yard yeah. sale oh, I hope Ken Foray still has his leopard print thong though yeah. he probably does I hope so. does somebody like not know that they're like sitting on a piece of iconic yeah. or wearing it yeah. or wearing hopefully it, yeah. wearing yeah. it but uh, sitting there and watching it and then I'll never forget it at one point, I think it's when you started straddling Jeffrey in the bed. Yeah. And Barbara like elbows me and she goes, I look great. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm so boss, let me tell you, you've yeah. been looking great for years. Oh my God. I yeah. I, wow. I'm, I'm so, I, I, now I feel so much better even making the internal jokes in my head about like, oh boy, how many times have we've uh, rolled in Z-Hay in my head, you know? <laughs> yeah. Now knowing Isn't that, that I, it, the, yeah. the feeling is mutual, so this is good. Yeah, but I mean, there was Or some... was mutual, was mutual. Then she worked with me and she's like, oh, <laughs> just dried up into sand. <laughs> no, no, I love you, you know that. I know. Yes, no, we, we had that. a great That's time, really a great, great relationship so on set. Good. Well, now that we have a camera on us, yeah. right? This is where things get real. Yeah, hot. where is this going? Uh, no, I know. no, no. It's a whole but... other show that I did not, I did not sign up for, and there was no intimacy coordinator. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if an intimacy yeah. coordinator just popped, popped up here. right now <laughs> with a yeah. sandwich, going like, "What's going on here?" Yeah, you guys, that would be Graham Skipper. Six inches, yeah, yeah. six inches. Um, no, we've never had the moment that was not six inches. What the way you thought? I saw your look, James. Like, get it out of your head. Get He's into Barbara's head. Of it for years. Uh, we've never had a moment on camera 
uh, <laughs> at least un- since Tribeca. Mm-hmm. And I talking wanted to say, movie. talk about the movie. And we, I know we can't, you know, technically. No, we're, we're talking about the fucking movie. <laughs> well, we're talking about the movie. I want to say thank you because how many times, uh, and in, in most cases, it's usually you're in the back of the theater yeah. or you're not even I know, there. I, I we've have, never, yeah. we've never had a, a moment where we've been able to be public about this. Mm-hmm. Um, but I love you. And I mean, and, and this it means the world to me that you entrusted me with um, with something that I know was dear to you, dear to Stuart, dear to Dennis. And somehow your crazy sex dream led you to email me years totally. later being I mean, like, well, you know, I dreamed he had a big dick. I wonder if he's got a big, <laughs> a big director's dick and uh, yeah. and could and could swing this this project into fruition. And, um, I, you know, I, I think that was my prophetic dream that mm-hmm. you were going to be the director of something that had to do with sex and Lovecraft and eroticism. I mean, you know, when I first read the script and Dennis had sent it to me, I said, oh my God, this is part of my legacy. This is what I need to do. And Lovecraft is my legacy, even more than being in horror. Mm. I feel like Lovecraft is, is, and there was no way that I wasn't gonna make this. Yeah. And I'm getting a little verklempt, oh. which I had before. We had one interview in, in Tribeca where I was like. Oh, all of us cried. I was crying. <laughs> yeah. Heather cried. Barbara cried. Jonathan laughed at us. No, no, he didn't. Yeah. He didn't. No, he didn't. Uh, but we we don't get often to say, like, thank you. And no, I but I thank, thank you. you, too, because I, you know, there was a lot of reasons that you were the guy. And there's a lot of reasons why I couldn't even imagine anybody else having tackled this and done such an amazing job. And now you're part of my legacy and I'm part of your legacy. And mm. like, it's really meaningful to no, me. Now I want to go to sleep and have a sex dream about Barbara and not feel <laughs> weird about it. It's going to yeah. be great, you know? Uh, this is like so sweet and yeah. weird all at the same time. I know, time. right? It's, it's, a, it's a lot of feels <laughs> going on. Yeah. No. feelings happening. But uh, yeah. I, I've, I've, very rarely had someone go to bat for me multiple times um, yes. on on both sides of the camera, and I got to watch her work like yes. live. Mm-hmm. It was a amazing. A, it, yeah. Seriously, like days where, and, and I joke about this a lot uh, in a, in a good way. But when you're doing a show and you watch, you know, really talented people working together, but then you watch, uh, and I've had this happen before with a, another actor producer. In a, in a negative way, but in a positive way for Barbara, she'll be in a scene doing like 30 pages a day or something like that and doing multiple scenes. And then when I call cut, she immediately goes like, hey, has lunch arrived? Oh, are, are you good? Hey, how are your kids? You know, it's like it, watching her producer hat turn on, like not everybody can do that. Yeah. And I've encountered very few people that can. Well, the the the. The reason that I could do that is because, and you talked about this on another podcast, I think, there's a thing that I started doing with you, and I've only done it with you, where I the videos? will- videos? I, I sent him videos. Not the kind of, you think. I can't no, tell if you're doing a bit or not. They're not sex videos, no. No, but it's, it's the scene. It's whatever scene I'm doing. Mm-hmm. I'm rehearsing at home, and then I film myself doing the scene, just my lines. Yeah. Because I want to make sure, and actually, I because I knew we were busy on Creep Show and we only had like three days and there was so much stuff going on. And also on our set, because I am a producer, I was like, I need to have my producer hat on at all times. Yeah. So I can't waste time with my acting shit. <laughs> I need to make sure that I got yeah. that down. So I would film myself saying my lines and acting and I would say, do you like the energy or do you think I'm going in the right direction? You know. So I had that all figured out. So when I got to set, I had to be prepared. I had, yeah. I knew exactly what I was Because you knew do. more than anybody else. Sometimes actors kind of get lost in the moment. They don't realize that one more take means yeah. that we're going to go into grace period and we might, it might cost us or, yeah. or yeah. we can't yeah. finish the day. You're thinking yeah. both from a talent standpoint and coming in prepared, knowing that from an economical standpoint, mm-hmm. if you can nail it in two, that means yeah. we can get to that next location. That's right. Even faster. Yeah. I've never like had that before where actors, I'll, I'll never forget being, in like at a Cracker Barrel in Atlanta while we were shooting Creep Show, and it was like a Sunday morning, and I'm getting all these uh, t- 
text and these video texts and Becca was like, what the, what's going on? Why are you getting all these weird texts? Yeah. I'm like, it's Barbara Cranton. And she's like, what's going on? Yeah. But she sent all of her variations on each of the scenes and like all these different takes and to be able to have those notes like yeah. immediately. I think I'm gonna start doing that I'm, now with I other think it's, directors if they want that. Yeah. I, directors out there, when Barbara yeah. Crampton sends you videos over text, you take them. You take yeah. them and you you give her notes back. Yeah. Trust me, it will save your day. It, well, we don't have time for rehearsal. You nope. know, it's yeah. like you show up and you yeah. do the scene. Especially and, now, yeah. everything is so condensed. You know, they're like pr films used to be much longer. The the time it would take to make a feature was oh much longer. God. Now we've condensed everything. So it, even more so, it's so valuable. It used to be mm -hmm. 10 years ago when I would say that I had uh, like a 25 day shoot, I yeah. would have other directors go, oh my God, 25 days, how can you do it? Yeah. Um, now 25 days is a luxury yeah. it could when be like 12 there. people are doing it in 12 days I, right? and like, they make How's it, it you know that? but the problem is is that then your film is scrutinized right up against the movies that had 45 That's days true. Yeah. there are differences yeah. in the quality of a movie good or bad and otherwise from a 12 day shoot to a 24 day shoot to a 40 day mm -hmm. shoot yeah. Yeah. you know it's the amount of takes you get it's yeah. the amount of coverage you get it's the amount of time that you're allowed to let the actors breathe instead of one take you just got to get the words out and you know then the actor sits there and goes but i was just rehearsing yeah. you know yeah. that's not fair um so to be scrutinized against those movies at the same time really sucks but at the same time when you have actors who come so prepared but also who care about the crew and is like grabbing that's, craft service yeah. and that's handing my, it out my, during lunch my, was my biggest thing because it was a hard shoot and we didn't have as many days. We had enough days, but we didn't have an, as many days as we wanted. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just wanted to make sure that everybody was having a good time and mm -hmm. was happy and felt well fed and cared for. Yep. Yeah. So anyway, enough about that. We have a little segment that we have to do. <laughs> so uh, I, I- I thought that was the segment of uh, you <laughs> talking about oh, having sex with me. You we're playing a game, motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nor normally, I don't take as much time with all the guests because we yeah. get right to the segment. Yeah. Okay. But you're special. This, yeah. is, special. Uh, this is like probably I think my favorite favorite part of the show so far. That yeah, was the didn't even my, I know. So trust I me, know. mine <laughs> too. <laughs> this is my favorite segment okay. of all time. <laughs> so, and to tomorrow when you all wake up, I want you to text me what your dream was. Okay. I'm like, trying to remember if Please, it, it if be, it, I've been journaling. Sex with me. You told me yeah. to journal. I've been journaling. You have been? Yeah. Yeah, because we're all now trying to make a concerted effort mm -hmm. to remember our dreams and talk about them. So yeah, mm -hmm. the more we do the show, we'll. And Barbara Crampton gives you homework. You do it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you know what's a nightmare? Dehydration. Yeah, you know what's an even worse nightmare? Plastic pollution. That's why we love Liquid Death and their evil mission to murder your thirst and kill plastic pollution. That's right, their aluminum cans are as metal as they get. So <laughs> pick some up today, because we all need something uh, refreshing to reach for when we wake up from a nightmare. It's true, cheers. <laughs> so I'm the side Barb. Okay. Did great, I done? Great job. And uh, <laughs> we, I have notes. We play games with people, and we have a new game. This we've never played this game before. Okay. And it's a game where the three of us are going to tell you a dream, and you have to guess which one is. The real dream, which it's like truth, it's like which two are the real ones? Yeah, which and wait, which so one like, is lying and making something up? It's like two oh, truths and a lie. Okay, yeah, this is okay, going great, I, guys. I, I didn't get that memo. Okay, so we decided we'd wing it. So <laughs> not not one of us is lying. Two two of us are lying. Two no. of us are telling the truth. Oh God! One of us is lying. Two, okay. Yeah, two. Bob shaking the his truth. head in the corner, like really, Barbara? <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're so talking one, about being so, so one is a, you didn't get the memo. One is a fake dream. Two are real. That's yeah. correct. Hopefully, that one correct, of them yeah. is having sex with me. Yes, yeah. two truths. They're actually, they're all that three of them. That was one of the. That was no. Just kidding. That's not. Yeah. That <laughs> okay. So, since we just did all the talking, why don't you start, Catherine? Okay. T tell us a dream. And oh, and you can go around twice and okay. ask us questions. Yes, right. follow up questions. To, to try to to try to oh wow, okay. yeah. Yeah. like yeah. who's yeah. telling the truth and who's not. Okay. Yeah. So I once had a dream where I was driving on a highway and I drove the car off the highway and it was as if I was going to die and I felt it going and I was like, this is the end, this is the end. And then I 
crashed and somehow I landed on all four tires and I thought I died, but then I just woke up and I was still in the car. Wait, you woke up in the dream? Yes. So like I, I like drove off, like we talked about, thought I died. Yeah. And, you know, just like that was it. It was black. But then I woke back up in the dream and was still So alive. there was a dream in a dream scenario. Yes, yes. And where were you on, like when you woke up, were you still driving? Were you at the bottom and everything was fine? Like where uh, were you at that I point? I was at the bottom and everything was fine. I had somehow okay. landed on the tires. Okay, all right. Okay. Quality dream, kind of like messed you. up. <laughs> I had a dream that uh, I was at, at my wedding again with Chelsea, which you were at. So it was. you can imagine it, but it was a little was different. Was I having sex? Uh, no, it was a, it's, yeah, no, sorry. Not at this point. Not that point. we know. <laughs> I'm milking too that bad, one forever. Too bad. Yeah. Sorry, a much better dream, just saying. <laughs> so uh, Chelsea was walking down the aisle and then we like looked out through the far doorway and from the venue, that doorway led into our house. And then we saw Molly, our dog, chase our cat Lucy towards us and Lucy was very scared and uh, Chelsea was like come here Lucy and Lucy hopped into Chelsea's arms and then she walked down the aisle with our cat in in her arms Present. which Aww. is which is fine because I would have given anything to have our cat at our wedding but we Aww. couldn't because she's a cat uh, but it's also anachronistic because we didn't have our dog uh, at the time we got married so wow. those things happened you had a prophetic dream yeah, I, maybe, maybe. Was I having sex with you? No, but maybe. Was I having sex with one of your animals? What, Joe? No. I'm just, I'm <laughs> asking Judy questions. Lucy I'm allowed Molly to alone. ask questions. No, I don't even, you know what? Even, I don't even think you were in my dream. How about Damn that? It. How about that, Joe? Fine, maybe the back of my head was in your dream. I was there. <laughs> yeah. All right, fine. I'm still, I'm still contemplating that one. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Um, so I had a dream, you know, and I have these kind of prophetic dreams. Tell me more. Uh, <laughs> about us having sex. No, uh, no, sorry. So um, I had an estranged relationship with my dad, like in real life. And my dad was on his deathbed. And I was trying to get to go see him. And my kids were really little. And it was hard for me to, to, to leave and go. And so I had this dream one night where I walked into his hotel room, not hotel room, hospital room, but it looked like a hotel room. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like weird. And then he was he was in this bed and in the dream, I had a conversation with him and told him all the things that I thought about him that I didn't appreciate because he wasn't a good dad to us and whatever. And so, he was having a conversation back with me and I couldn't really see his face. Like it kept like coming in and out of focus, but I said everything that I wanted to say to him. And then, and then he said he was sorry about different stuff from our experiences growing up. And then I woke up and actually that was a really good dream because it made me feel better. Did you feel like it he, was catharsis? Like, did you find like yeah, closure kinda, in a way? I kind of woke up and yeah, had like a little closure. But then he died a few days later, and oh, so I wow. never, so I never got to talk to him. Okay, when I die in your yeah. dreams, please let me know um, so I can make make arrangements. <gasps> yeah, because she because like you really are. This is very like your prophetic dreams clearly come true in some form or another. When was the last time that you talked to him before that? Um. Like, was it really random that he popped up in your head? No, no. I mean, I knew he was sick. Um, it was probably maybe five years ago or so. I mean, he was estranged from the family, but we did invite him for Christmas, like five years before that, with a big extended family gathering. Mm -hmm. So he was around us a little bit. Yeah. Um, anyway, so maybe five years before. And at that point... But he never met my kids or anything. Uh, that's what I was yeah, going to ask. Yeah. So do you feel like that was something, because I think that's something that parents always yeah. have in harbor that like, because usually when it comes to kids, the grandparents are always like, finally, I get my get grandkids. And yeah. when that's taken from them mm -hmm. or they don't accept it, that becomes mm -hmm. something that we deal with, you know, as parents. So maybe that was something that you were harboring as well. Yeah, I don't think he cared to know my kids, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. I don't think he cared. No. Well, Interesting. Your kids are amazing. No, so but. Who worked it on your kids worked on the film? 
They did. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, they were Luke amazing. Oh, they were amazing they were on set. On the movie, they'd never been on a movie set before. And we ruined them. <laughs> yeah. They, no, that's not they true. They decided no. they didn't want a career in cinema. After they that. No. they had the best time. I was really proud of them too because I think they did a good job. Both of yeah. those both those kids were our stand-ins. In most cases, I have so many shots of Olivia being Heather Graham. Oh, in the I, movie. I thought you were going to be a stand-in for Bart because they looked. Just well, like actually, she did for both. Like, yeah. 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 It, yeah. It's crazy. There was a moment when we were watching From Beyond, and I think it was Becca was like, oh, my God, it looks like Olivia. <laughs> like, really? crap, like, wow. like that version of you yeah. captured in time looked exactly like your daughter. And then right. we were like, I wonder if she owns that, that uh, BDSM wardrobe as well. Just saying. <laughs> but that's another conversation for another yeah. day. All right. Yeah. So now do I have to now say? Yeah. Like, yeah, you, you can ask any follow-ups you, you want. Uh, but. You can go around and ask a follow-up All right. if you want. Okay. Or you can make a cold guess. What, what's funny about this is like the follow-up questions are going to be him trying to determine what's r real or not, but it, they're dreams. So he could ask like, <laughs> yeah. what were you doing? As, I don't know, man, no, it's a fucking it's a dream. dream. Yeah, There's no true. logic to it. Yeah. See, I got to see, I was already investigating unbeknownst to you guys. I was already asking questions. You, you know, what? I was being well, I mean, inquisitive. I, yeah. 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 I tried. I know, kind um, of cheating, but it's okay. No, I not like cheating. Really ask no, me I, any questions, I, I think Joe. that was a good way to do it because in the moment you kind of have to ask like. Yeah. Cause now, more, yeah. like now I'm sitting there going like, well, I feel like I've well, gotten enough this is, mm. you know, this is okay. me putting my Colombo hat on now. Now I now I get to figure, like, determine who who really was the Liar. real dreamer. Um, I'm gonna go with Catherine. I'm gonna say that yours is the fake dream. No, it's not the fake dream. Yours? No, I really dreamt that. Mine's the fake dream. <laughs> what? I swear to yeah. God, I was like, it's you're like, definitely you're so not prophetic. Wow, it's so it's so, so real. We got, we got people in this bitch. room. We got people in this room. <laughs> that, yeah, that was like, a fake dream. No, but I'll let me be honest with you guys. Good job. I told you something <laughs> that happened in real life. So that oh, happened in real life. Oh, okay. So that's why you're so. To act, but actually, I speak went. Truthfully. My father was on his deathbed, mm -hmm. and I hadn't seen him in a while, and my girlfriend said. You, you know, she, her name is Shanti. So she's like, you know, very <laughs> spiritual. She said, I said, oh, I don't have a good relationship with my father and he's on his deathbed. She goes, you have to go see him. You have to say everything you've ever wanted to say to him before he dies. This is your time, Barbara. He fucking left your family. Anyway, yeah, I have a bad child. And <laughs> Nobody knows this. So um, I'm saying a lot of things that I've never told anybody today. I know. Anyway, I know. so I did. I got, my kids were little. I got on a plane and I went to my father's, not hotel room, yeah. his hospital room. And I said everything I want that I wanted to say. He to was him, awake? That, yeah, he was awake that, I, that he never, you know, he just wasn't there for us. Yeah. So I don't need to go into the detail, but he, um, so he listened to everything that I had to say. And then he said, he didn't apologize. In my dream, I said, I might fake dream. He, yeah. he said, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, you know, I, 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 I was there for you. I, I don't know what you wanted from me an anyway. Narrative. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, you had a fine childhood. You had a fine upbringing. I, you know, I left you guys when you were 11. You were fine and blah, blah, blah. He was just, anyway, it was in that moment that I, that I had an epiphany well, actually, he came and went until the time that I was 11 years old. So he actually wasn't in my life until I was 11. Mm -hmm. He came and went. He was like yeah. a serial cheater and would uh. leave and come back. Anyway, he's just a bad guy. So I had this epiphany that I am so glad he wasn't in my life because he's mm -hmm. a bad person. And if he had been in my life, I maybe wouldn't have you know, been the good, good person, person that I think that I am because mm -hmm. he's a bad guy. So it's better not to have a bad guy in your life. Mm -hmm. so anyway. You're you're glad that you went and talked to him like that? Oh my God, I thank my was girlfriend. It, yeah. Was it? It a, was so, yes, credit. because I really, I did have closure with that because yeah. mm -hmm. that was a real happening and I, yeah, I totally had closure. Because my, my yeah. sister uh, told me to like say stuff to my dad when he was on his deathbed and I chose not to. I just oh really yeah did you I, have a similar kind of um it wasn't as bad but there were definitely issues but for me it, he wasn't a bad he was just a faulty guy yeah. you know okay. and so i didn't i felt like it wasn't important for me to like bring that stuff up during mm -hmm. his last so like 
I'm okay with having not done it, but I feel like they're, they're different situations. So, yeah. yeah, but yeah, I remember my sister was like, you should do. And I was like, I don't know. I'll just let him be. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I think we're both okay. Yeah. We're self actualized people. You're both amazing, people. amazing people, <laughs> yeah. both of you. Oh, thanks, Kat. I'm yeah. a piece of shit. <laughs> you guys are, yeah. Wow, I didn't think this was going to yeah. get this deep. Yeah, like, me neither. Me neither. <laughs> we've oh we've God, gone wow. to so many places here on Scream Tuesday. It's yeah. amazing. But listen, guys, I'm sorry to say I have to go. I oh, love shit. you. I'll see you all. I love you, Barbara. In another atmosphere. I'll see you in my dreams, <laughs> Joe I'll uh, definitely uh, see you in <gasps> Barbara. Wait. Oh, typical producer. Yeah. God, she just disappears. In and We're out now, so yeah. quickly. You had one more question. And it's gone. I just, I just wanted to know about what was going to happen with you know the new reanimator, but I guess I can't find out. She disappears again. So <sighs> You can't tease that, man. You're going to get a lot of people real excited. <laughs> <laughs> I've gone through a lot of life changes. Um, and uh, the thing that at the end of the day, Oh boy, I'm gonna I'm gonna reveal something here. Um, at the end of the day, uh, love has gotten me through a lot, a wow. lot, and I've been really lucky that I've found someone that I love a lot that you know that loves me. But the thing that um, the reason why I bring that up is whenever things have always been at its darkest and to the point where like I fear going to bed because I'm so scared of like my dreams or even just the anxiety of waking up the next morning. Like for years, I would have this nervous tick where um, my foot would start shaking. And I think that came from the fact that I would get these um, alerts in my email when I was below $500 in my checking account. Oh, yeah, oh, And yeah. it's that I terrifying feeling. And it, it's the worst because you wake up, especially when you have like a family and you're like, how am I going to provide? How am yeah. I going to do what I'm supposed to do and be responsible, be a responsible adult, be a responsible family man, a father, yeah. what have you. And, and But also, you know, then you make a movie and it's like, well, now I have a lot more money that I, <laughs> I'm interested in yeah. to create my vision. But at the end of the day, the light at the end of my tunnel is the moment when a movie starts, uh, whether it's in the theater uh -huh. or it's at home and the title card comes up and a hand clasps my hand, and we know we're going on a journey together. And in most cases, especially when it's a movie, like in a theater, you're not gonna get up. You're not gonna check your phone. Yeah. You're not gonna check yeah. Rotten Tomatoes and go, fuck, our audience score went down. Yeah. Like all of these things that can distract you from the moment and take you out of that moment. Um, I'm lucky that I found someone that enjoys that adventure with me every time I push play, or I sit down and I watch what have yeah. you. Um, uh, as a sidebar, you guys are going to enjoy this. So uh, the last two days, I haven't been to the movies other than my own fucking film in, in the past like six weeks, and it's been killing me. Mm -hmm. So uh, over the last two nights, uh, Becca and I went to go see uh, Killers of the Flower Moon. Nice. Uh, and the, uh, the Taylor Swift movie. Oh, <laughs> like, that's right. We talked about that. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, that movie. Yeah. Th like, dude, <laughs> I'm telling you right now, Taylor Swift Genius, absolute <laughs> genius of a filmmaker. The fact that I loved this movie. I fell asleep twice during Killers of the Flower Moon. Wow. No didn't, didn't sleep for a beat during Taylor Swift. Oh my God. <laughs> there were also people like yeah, I was yelling say, and how you and you? jumping yeah. around where, you know, the Killers of the Flower Moon doesn't really have like, a lot of rah rah yes. moments. Yes. But every time I needed those two moments last night when the lights went down and Nicole Kidman pops up yeah. Yeah. and everyone cheers. <laughs> And the movie starts because like, whenever I have anxiety, whenever I'm terrified to go to sleep because I know that I'm gonna have that anxiety going on again in my dreams. And then, then even worse, I have to wake up after that moment yeah. of respite and, and, and then go about my day and uh -huh. deal with those anxieties again. I know that when we start the movie, all that goes away and I'm always chasing the end I'm always hoping, and I think this is where my love for movies comes from, if I can share that with someone with my own films, you know, and let them kind of disappear yeah. for 90 minutes, two hours or what have you, and not face their own fears or maybe deal with them, you know, in a way that's constructive, yeah. but also just allows them to get away from their problems. That's that's the dream for me. Like that is that's that's the hope that I have. When I have someone come up to me and say, that this actually happened at Beyond Fest. Uh, someone came up to me and said, 
uh, I my fam I, my mom has cancer and I just lost my job and my kids are living in a hotel with me. And I never thought in a million years that I would go, I have to go see this movie. And for the last two hours, I forgot all about my problems. Oh, that's amazing. I mean, that's like, that's the best feeling in the world. So, you know, and, but that's the same way it is for me as well. Yeah. With those movies that other people have made, you know, like to be able to, you know, step away from the nightmares for a little bit is yeah. always the best. Well, what an amazing pinpoint to end that on. I love that so much, Joe. Thank you. Joe Lynch, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, Hi, thanks, bye Joe. cameras. Bye. <laughs> bye camera, bye camera. Suitable flesh. Yes. How yes. now? Yes. Uh, I'm what? still in PR mode. I can't no, help it. No, no, no. Go That's for it. Full plug. The floor yeah. is yours. Uh, well, uh, suitable flesh. Uh, you, you know it, you love it or hate it. You know what? Who cares? Uh, support indie film, support indie horror, um, support horny films. We need more of them. Uh, but yeah, you can uh, follow me on Letterboxd at the Joe Lynch. Um, you'll see <laughs> that I'm w equally watching and giving four stars to Killers of the Flower Moon and Taylor Swift and a bevy of other, other movies. And we can discuss on there. Um, but also uh, social media. I'm at the Joe Lynch on everything else as well. Thank you there so you much, Joe. Until next time, this is Scream Dreams. Uh, make sure to follow us on all the social media accounts and like and subscribe on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Um, and write into us. Tell us what your nightmares are, what you want to see on the show. Send us a letter. Yeah. Pay for postage. Pay yeah. for postage. Wow, the, go the good old days. <laughs> Not just, you know, just comment on James's letterboxed. Yeah. It's kind of yeah. weird. <laughs> and what's the final line, James? Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Until next time, I'm Catherine Corcoran. And I'm James A. Janice, and keep the light on. Is that right? <laughs> Is that right? Close enough. <laughs> <laughs>